recording, right? Okay, uh, let's start. Um, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. First of all, please mute yourself uh, during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. Uh, therefore, no classified discussion is allowed. So please watch out. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now, let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Ashish Chattapat, uh, who is a PhD student at uh, Rice University. He did his bachelor's uh, from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Patna, where he worked primarily in uh, optimization and computational geometry for fluid interface modeling. He got his master's from the University of Texas, El Paso, from the computational science program, where his research was focused on high performance computing. Since then, he has been a PhD student at Rice University in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, where he works at the intersection of theoretical deep learning, dynamical systems, and turbulence modeling for broad applications in forecasting atmospheric dynamics and extreme weather. During his PhD, <clears throat> he has spent a year and a half at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as a research intern affiliate, uh, working in different areas of geometric and generative deep learning for stochastic emulation of all system models. Today, Ashish um, will give a talk with the title of Deep Learning Meets Data Assimilation on Physically cons Consistent Architectures and Hybrid Ensemble Kalman fil Filters for Weather Forecasting. Please expect a wonderful talk and enjoy it. Um, now, without further ado, uh, let me pass the button to Ashish by asking one random question as usual. Today's random question is, uh, what is your favorite things to do other than research? So the maximum amount of time I spend outside research is with a small group of people where we have a small musical band. So I spend a lot of time in music. So yeah, apart from that, I think it's been more or less PhD. <laughs> nice. So do you play any instrument? Yeah, I, I play a percussion instrument called the cajon. It's, oh, I never heard of it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a version of a drum where your neighbors don't get very angry at you. So. That's okay. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, the stage is yours, is yours, Ashish. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. Okay, so my name is Ashish. I'll be talking today about uh, some aspects of uh, uh, putting deep learning and data assimilation together with physically consistent architectures. And the kind of data assimilation algorithms that I talk about today are sequential ones, and I'll, and I'll introduce them and how it works. And it'll be based on ensemble Kalman filters. And all of this is aimed towards applications uh, in weather and climate modeling, how to improve current weather and climate models, uh, and so on. But in, do in doing so, we are going to look at a hierarchy of complexity in terms of systems and how to, how to develop algorithms in, for example, say a simpler system and then generalize it to more complex systems. So uh, before I start, I want to uh, give out uh, my, my sincere thanks to all my mentors and collaborators. Uh, a significant portion of this work was done at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, where I spent some time. Uh, most of it uh, was done with my advisor, Pedro Hassan Zadeh, um, uh, and, my, and my colleague, uh, Ibrahim uh, at, at Rice, and uh, our collaborator at, at currently who's at LMD in Paris, A.V. Bach. Okay, so the motivation behind most of the work that we do in our lab and, and, and what I worked on is our weather and climate system. And, and the challenge that, with the, that weather and climate systems have is that it's a multi-scale chaotic dynamical system and, and the process, the physical processes uh, that are involved in, in a weather system ranges from, for example, micrometers to tens and thousands of kilometers in space, as well as seconds or minutes to maybe multiple years in terms of time. So it's, it's a multi-scale system 
and there is really no scale separation among the physical processes that are happening inside the weather system. For example, uh, in 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 the weather system, you would see very large scale, uh, very large scale. For example, the uh, large scale circulation or the weather maps that we see in our news station to synoptic scale patterns. For example, thunderstorms and tornadoes to very small scale, uh, small scale processes. For example, gravity waves, which in today's state of the art uh, climate models, or, may, or many of the climate models today, are actually under resolved or not resolved at all and parameterized. So, the difficulty, the challenge here in, in, in writing a climate model, for example, or, or, uh, or really resolving uh, 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 the, the flow around, uh, for, around the entire Earth is that you have to resolve uh, both your space and time into. Into, into a very large number of grid points, into a very large number of grid points to account for the very small scale processes as well. If you really wanted to resolve all the physical processes ranging from the micrometers to the kilometers, right? So you could typically think of the system as having a large scale flow X and, 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 and a smaller or fast scale flow Y. And then there's some poorly understood variables. Uh, maybe, maybe you could think that gravity waves is one of those poorly understood variables that, that, that maybe you could ignore for the time being although they are actually parameterized in climate models. Uh, but if you think of it that way, then, then ideally what climate models would do that is that they would really resolve the large scale flow. That is, they will actually go and integrate the, uh, uh, the equations of the large scale dynamics numerically, and they would somehow approximately account for the effect that the small scale processes would have on the large scale variables, right? And this process is called parameterization. For example, convection is parameterized in, in, in many of the climate models. Uh, clouds, for example, are very small scale processes, so they, they, they cannot really be resolved in, in many of the climate models. So they have to be parameterized, while more and more recent climate models actually do have uh, cloud resolving components as well, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. The idea is you can't really afford to resolve all the processes. That's not computationally tractable. So what you do is resolve some of the resolve the large scale processes, and then you really account for the effects of the small scale, small scale processes on the large scale in, in form of some approximation. Either these are semi-empirical approximations driven by physics, or more recently, there's been a surge in interest for having data-driven approximations where you can really learn from data. So if you think about today's challenges in terms of data-driven modeling for improving weather and climate models, then we could maybe divide it, and, and this is really my perspective of it, you could really divide into three major categories of problems. The first one being, can you account for these unresolved physical processes in a data-driven manner? So uh, here what you're seeing is that uh, there is, when you, when, you, when you divide the Earth into large, larger grids, tractable grids, 100 kilometers or so, then you're not accounting for the dynamics of the physical processes that are within that high 100 kilometers, right? The small scale processes. And, that, and so if you really wanted to solve the governing equations, you have to account for the forcing that those small scale processes would give on, on the large scale on the large scale flow. And, and so far in climate models, you have this semi-empirical function F, which is which is derived from physics and, and, and a bit of empirics as well. And you really account for how these small scale processes may, may vary as a function of the large scale flow. Right, so so really, the idea is uh, have a static function uh, that is that is purely a function of the large scale variables, but accounts for the accounts for the effects that it would have that the small scale processes would have for the large scale flow. Or what one can do is that if you could afford high resolution simulations, for example, say locally, or if you have observations which are high resolution enough, then you can learn the effect, you can learn the tendency of these small scale processes y as a function of x by using some sort of a data driven model. And, and I call this a neural network, could be a kind of neural network, could be something else as well. But, but you don't have any a priori structure as to how y varies as a function of x, but you could really just fit a very over parameterized model and see, and, and you see whether you get a good representation of y or not. And these approaches are called data driven approaches and they're called DDP. But of course, you see there's a problem here is that you really you're really saying that y is in quasi equilibrium with x that that is y varies purely as a function of x. It does not it does not vary as a function for it, for example of its memory of its memory. So it is not dependent on how y varies in the previous time frames. 
but we know that is a fact because y is also a dynamical the, the, the evolution of y is also covered by a dynamical system so y should be non markovian in nature and and that approach is called super parameterization and this actually does exist in many of the climate models today although they're not i guess uh, operational ones for example e3sm is a super parameterized model from the oe uh, from ncar it, it used to be um, sp cam which was a super parameterized cam model and the idea behind super parameterization was that okay i will resolve the large scale variables on a on on a low resolution grid but inside each of these grid cells as you see inside each of these grid cells i will i will dynamic i will numerically solve the equations governing the small scale processes y but maybe not the exact equations maybe some approximation of that something that is more tractable so in doing so, what you do, what what you what you ensure is that you don't assume that y is in quasi equilibrium with x. You actually solve uh, the the time dependent y equations to some extent. And a data driven version of that DDSP, the thing that we had worked on, was that you you if you if you were to afford high resolution simulations or had uh, observations, then you try to fit a uh, in a stateful neural network, like for example a recurrent neural network as a function of both the large scale variables and the small scale variables of the previous time step. Now, as you, know, as you understand, these are not purely data driven models. You need to then couple these equations back into your large scale numerical solver and then and solve it in a tightly coupled fashion. So this is one aspect of what data driven, data -driven modeling in climate and weather looks like today. Of course, there's another uh, approach to doing this is that we really are often just interested in the large scale variability. For example, we're interested in the large scale circulation, not necessarily about. We do not we do not necessarily want to probe into uh, the small scale processes as long as we are correctly accounting for them. So we could have a fully data driven model that just learns from the large scale variables, so that it can it can just look at the time history. Uh, you can, one can just look at the time history of the large scale variable and evolve it with a neural network. While this is obviously a much more challenging problem because you're not really accounting for Y, but just assuming that somehow the information of Y is independent in X, this has been uh, a, a, an area of recent interest from, from multiple different groups, including ours, Berkeley Lab and University of Washington, where Dale Duran and Jonathan Wayne have shown some really amazing results uh, of what you could achieve by by training uh, a complicated enough neural network on observational data and, and and how you can forecast, you can actually come very close to what operational forecasting stands where operational forecasting stands today. Um, so the, the third aspect of it is improving data assimilation and data assimilation. I'll talk about it in more details. Is that it's a it's a process by which you integrate observational data. So you, you take uh, observations which come in as noisy and sparse data and you integrate into your dynamical model uh, in such a way that you have a better representation, a better estimate of your of the state of the system with which you can start forecasting. And today I'll focus on the, 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 second, uh, the, the second and the third point here. I look at climate models that look like this. DDWP stands for Data Driven Weather weather prediction. So this is not a coupled numerical uh, deep learning scheme. It's a purely data driven scheme where you have where you're trying to predict the large scale variable directly with the help of a data driven model. And then I look at how I can use deep learning to improve data simulation to some extent, or at least enhance computations involved in data simulation, how these two can be tightly coupled together for forecasting applications. I will not focus on any of the work uh, related to DDP or DDSP. So to look at the, to look at the kind of uh, developments that we did, we will look at a hierarchy of systems, not directly go to the most complex climate model ever, but we'll first look at a two-layer quasi-geostrophic flow and develop a hybrid deep learning based uh, the data simulation scheme. Look at how we can tractably generate large number of ensembles for predictions and the challenges and opportunities there. And then we are gonna look at reanalysis and observation. So go to the most complex climate. So the reanalysis is not completely observations. So it is. It has a data simulation component to it as well, but it's the closest to observations that we can get. So we are going to look at how we can facilitate predictions by training on actual observational data, and how we can couple DA schemes to a DDWP model at that, at this uh, hierarchy of complexity as well. So obviously, uh, getting data from reanalysis would involve running a full NWP. 
So uh, the computational cost is obviously much higher. The complexity of this data is much higher than the complexity of this data as well. So this is more or less a chart. Uh, really development would involve making this line much more dense, having more, many more systems, making sure they generalize across these systems. But I'll look at these two things today. So a little bit about data assimilation. So data assimilation is used in engineering and the earth sciences, uh, in both engineering and earth sciences. And in fact, it's an indispensable process in weather forecasting. And, and the way it works or the way it looks like is this. Suppose you have a system and you have a dynamical model of your system uh, with which you want to forecast it. So ideally, you start with an initial condition which may not be accurate. It could be noisy, it could be sparse. You may have interpolated onto a grid so that it can facilitate the resolution of your dynamical model. And you start forecasting with your model. Now, more often than not, this model of your system, especially if the system is complex, will not have all the relevant physics. It will have some missing component or it would have some parameterizations which are not accurate. So your model trajectory is going to deviate from the true trajectory of your system, right? And, and from, from time and again, you will get observations from your systems, which are given, are given in red. And the idea of data simulation is that you take the model forecasts, you take the observation at that time, if it's available, and then you combine these two information to come up with an estimate of your state, which may be a more faithful and a true representation of the state of your system at that point of time. And in a sequential data simulation algorithm, for example, ENKF, that I'll talk about, ensemble family filter, as you have more and more observations, you're going to converge to a more correct uh, or a true representation of your state as you keep on uh, updating an ensemble family filter. So as you move on and you get more and more observations, your estimated state is going to be more closer to the true trajectory as compared to your model state or as compared to an observation, which is actually going to be very noisy. So observations come in as very noisy, sparse data, uh, you know, you have to be able to assimilate them before it can be used to be useful anyway. And once you have this estimate of your state, you can start forecasting by treating this as the initial condition as compared to an observation on a model forecast. So use this as the initial condition which is a better representation of the state. You could get better forecast uh, accuracies with your dynamical model, even though it might have missing physics. So in order to propose the algorithm that we want to talk about, and we're going to propose a hybrid ensemble Kalman filter, which, which has a deep learning component to it. The system that, that we will consider is a two-layered quasi-geostrophic flow, <coughs> a two-layered quasi-geostrophic flow. And um, in this system, this is a very simple climate model, very simple two-layered climate model. It's used as a canonical, like a textbook example to start off with new algorithms. Uh, it has two, two layers, so it has two states. The states are going to be the stream function at the upper and the lower level. What you're showing in the what I'm showing on the video is the shading, which is given by the which is the velocity, and then the open contours of the stream function. This is a good representation. This is simple, but a great representation of the mid-latitude dynamics of the, of, of the Earth. So it's not a full climate model. It, 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 it's not even close to a full climate model. Where it's a good place to start. It's a, it's a fully turbulent flow, so it has all complexities that you'd see in atmospheric dynamics in terms of uh, the nature of turbulence that exists in atmospheric dynamics. So let's look at what a regular data assimilation with ensemble Kalman filter would look like in a system like this. So you start with an initial condition, okay, of your of the state of your system, and then you perturb this initial condition to generate an ensemble, and you perturb it typically maybe using Gaussian random noise. And then you have a bunch of ensemble members, right? And each ensemble member is indexed by J over here. So what you do then is that you use a numerical model of, of your QG flow, for example, in this system, and you integrate each of these ensemble members until, for example, say 200 delta T. And why did I choose 200 delta T here? Because in this system, that's equivalent to one day, one Earth day. And suppose, assume that in this system, you have observations coming in every day. Albeit, they come in, come in as, as, uh, as noisy, observations, not, not, not perfect ones. So the first thing that you would do uh, uh, while, while implementing your ensemble Kalman filter is that you would first compute this background covariance matrix, which is the expectation of this quantity. And if you look carefully, this quantity is dependent on all the ensemble members that you have integrated for 200 delta T. Once you compute this background covariance, you get a, you get a Kalman gain, which is uh, the, the, the Kalman gain uh, is then used to weigh the observations and the background forecast. So this background forecast is coming from your model, the observation is coming from the system, and the Kalman gain is something that you've computed from the background covariance matrix. Okay. Now the problem with this approach is that if you're in the system that you're that 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 you're 
that the, if the, if the system that you have is very high dimensional, then the number of ensemble members that you need has to be sort of of the same order of magnitude as the number of states of your system. So you really need to integrate all the ensemble members. And if, for example, this system has 36,000 states, so you really want to afford, uh, you really want to be able to afford to integrate ensemble members in, in, in the ranges of 2,000 or 3,000, which could be very intractable for, for certain systems. Now think about the weather and climate situation where you have 10 power eight states. You really can't afford to integrate that many number of ensemble members using an NWP, right? Because that's that's too expensive. So what people typically resort to is that, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll integrate a few ensemble members, typically in the order of magnitude of 50, and I'll resort to a low rank, a rank deficient P matrix, because then this background covariance matrix becomes rank deficient. It suffers from sampling error. So it gives some spurious correlations, which may affect the accuracy of your Calvin gain and hence the accuracy of your estimated state. So let's look at how this works out with different number of ensemble members. So you have 20 ensemble members. You see the normalized RMC, it tries to come down every time you have data simulation. Every time you have an observation, you're assimilating, you're getting a better estimate of the state, but the overall trend of this RMC curve is upward, which means this filter is not converging, it's actually diverging. And the reason is you don't have enough number of ensemble members. Even with the 100 ensemble members, which is in, sort of intractable in the system, uh, you, you still have a divergent filter. Only when you can increase the number of ensembles to say 5,000, that is when you have a, a convergent filter that is at that 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 is the error comes down every time you have data simulation and you have a constant error curve so this is really what you'd expect and the reason this happens is because if you investigate the background covariance matrix the what i'm showing you here is the correlation that i get from p by looking at this point on the domain so what i ideally expect is that this point is correlated with itself and not correlated with any other point in the domain but you see, there is a lot of spurious correlations all over. It should look like this, a blob of correlation at the center and, and, and nothing around. But it, it has a lot of spurious correlations, really saying that the instantaneous wind in you know, Texas is correlated to the instantaneous wind in Beijing, something like that, which, which, which may not be true. In most cases, it's not true. So, so this is the reason that this is, this, is, this is due to rank deficiency, this is due to sampling error, and this causes this blow up. <coughs> now, what we are proposing is a, a deep learning based uh, surrogate to enhance the computation of P. So let's see how that, how that would look like. So the first step to that process is actually building a data driven surrogate for this system. So instead of integrating, uh, instead, of in, uh, instead of integrating the system numerically, one could of course build a data driven emulator that, that integrates the state of the system from time T to T plus 40 into T. So, this emulator may not be very accurate for very long, right? But we don't need it to be accurate for a very long time. We need to be accurate for a very short number of time steps. And we have reasons to believe, as I'll show you later on, that even for very complicated systems, this approach to building fully data-driven surrogates for forecasting actually works out. And suppose that you have been able to train it this way, and you have a surrogate that goes from time t to t plus 40 delta t with a deep learning model, then, our approach to doing hybrid ensemble Kalman filter is that you keep this pathway the same, but you integrate, a, 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 but, but you introduce a parallel unit that integrates a large number of ensembles from the same initial condition. Now, because a trained unit is going to be very cheap during inference, you can actually afford thousands of ensembles here. And just to give you a cost comparison of how this scales, the time required to integrate one numerical ensemble with this numerical model is the same as the time required to integrate 200 of these data driven ensembles. Okay, so you keep integrating them up to 200 delta t until you get a state at 200 delta t with the unit. And then instead of computing the background covariance with the, with the numerical ensembles, you compute the background covariance with these thousands and thousands of data driven ensembles that you were able to afford. And here's a trick that you just need this data driven model to be accurate for 200 delta T. It just needs to be able to integrate accurately for 200 delta T. So you get a not rank deficient matrix P. Well, it is going to be rank deficient still, but it's less, it's, it's less than nearby. You can over thousands of ensembles, so it's, it has less sampling error as compared to the numerical ensemble. So you get your back, so you get your Kalman gain based on that, but your background forecast 
you still get it from a more accurate numerical model that has integrated a small number of ensembles, something that is affordable. So you have this hybrid approach to computing K with a deep learning model and the background forecast with, with, with a numerical model. And then you get an estimated state. Uh, you have their analysis state, which you hope is a better representation of the true state of your system. So let's see how it really does. So this is a regular ensemble Kalman filter over 60 DA cycles for this system. And it uses 20 numerical ensembles, something that is roughly tractable for this system. Now, if I, if I, if I trade away 10 of these numerical ensembles for 2000 data driven ensembles, remember the cost conversion, 10 of these is equivalent to 2000 of these. The line that I get is the black line, which is stable and accurate and about four times reduction in error at the end of 60 DA cycles. And in fact, with half the number of, uh, half the computational cost, half the number of data driven ensembles, I can get the blue curve, which looks visually to have the same accuracy as 2000 data driven ensembles. So really this box and this box has no difference in computational cost. I've just traded away 10 of these numerical ensembles for 2000 data driven ensembles. And this is the performance gain that I have. So this model, has absolutely no forecasting skill, to be honest, with 20 numerical ensembles, while this model would have uh, a far better forecasting skill. And the reason is, again, the background covariance, the, the spurious sampling, uh, the, the spurious correlations arise due to sampling error because you have low number of ensembles. This is what it would look like with 20 numerical ensembles. Trade 10 of them for data-driven ones, and you would have a much more localized structure of your covariance matrix. And, and this gives you a better estimate of your analysis state. So if you plug that analysis state in to your dynamical model, this is the forecast accuracies that you would get. This is free pro forecasting. So this is with the analysis state that you obtained with, with, with this ENKF model, HNKF model. So uh, if you consider 0.6 to be like the prediction horizon limit, for example, then uh, this model has about five and a half days of forecast forecasting skill while while this model actually has much lesser. So despite the fact that their analysis states look visually same, it's a very chaotic system, so error is going to grow very quickly. So there is a difference. Uh, there, there is a advantage in using more number of data-driven ensembles. Now, the main challenge in this, pro in this work was never about the ensemble, like it wasn't about implementation on ensemble calming field, it was about building that data-driven surrogate that works. And, and I did it for a QG flow. One could ask what would happen when it's a more complex system. Well, we did it for complex systems as well. And here's an example. Uh, this paper and more recent papers actually tried to build these surrogates for uh, trained on reanalysis data. So really observational data for, 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 for weather. And what they showed was that these data driven models may not uh, be competitive with operational forecasting models. So IFS T63, while it's not operational forecasting, it could be <coughs> it is a NWP that is run by ECMWF, which is very accurate, which is this line. What you're looking at is the ACC of Z500, which is the large scale circulation five kilometers above the Earth's surface, and how the accuracy ACC is like um, correlation, correlation coefficient. And, and, and this blue line is a, a, a deep learning based unit model that integrates Z500 exactly the same way I did it for QG, almost exactly the same way I did for QG. Now, while it is not comparable to other operational models, but for one day, it is actually quite competitive. So for if you look at a one day forecasting skill, then it is going to be competitive to any operational model. And, and, and things have moved on since, since this picture, we have better models now, but uh, uh, for one day, it can be very competitive. And that's what we need for, for data simulation. We don't need it to be accurate forever. We just need it to be accurate for the length of time until which I get another observation and I can integrate it. And we also showed that you can improve more uh, improve on these models by adding more physics into it and talk about this this picture on the right uh, in, in in a short bit but it is possible to build these data driven surrogates for short time scales which can be in fact as accurate today it can be as accurate as operational ifs models that ecmwf runs now of course this is the challenge that we talked about so let's go to a more complex system like i said what is what would be what is the main challenge of having a more complex system uh, well one of them is we are we are sort of uh, married to a convolutional architecture, which in the, the unit was a convolutional architecture. One of the things we wanted to ask was, was it even uh, did it make sense to have a convolutional architecture in the first place? And and one of the things that we did earlier on with an extreme events paper was that 
we realized that uh, you know as if if you look at the weather patterns on 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 uh, if you look at the z500 circulation patterns you may have for example a high pressure anomaly over a low pressure anomaly or you may have a situation where you have a low pressure anomaly over a high pressure and these two are different uh, configurations of the pressure system right and 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 these two really would be treated as should be treated as two different features now and it's important here because this can likely lead to an extreme event while this would probably just be a Rossby wave moving eastward. So these two are different situations. And it turns out that your, your convolutional architecture, which is invariant to translation, but not to rotation and, and other orientations, can't really, uh, by construction, figure out uh, the difference between these two. They, they, if, if this is extracted as a feature set, then these two are the same features, because it does not understand the relative differences between orientations. Not to say that it never would. If you train an enough number of samples, these are very expressive networks, it might, but they're not that by construction, right? They're not equivariant by construction. And, and there's a better architecture to do, go about in doing that. And a very long time back, this was called capsule neural networks. And now we have better versions of equivariant neural networks that, that deal with this. But generally, the idea is that you have to be able to capture rotational, rotational variances in your features, rotational variances in the, in, the, in the flow features when you're, when you're, when you're trying to predict especially for physical systems such as these, right? Uh, so, so capturing rotational features became an important challenge, for, especially for complex systems. And, and, and really what we wanted to do was if, you're, if, if, if your input, for example, your, 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 your state was rotating in this manner, I, wanted, I want my neural network, and I'm calling it a spatial transformer in this case, to be able to really capture the rotational behavior, like really capture the features that are, that are rotating in space, at least the SO3 part. We, we want our networks to be uh, SO3 equivariant. That's, that, that's one of the things that, that, that we realized we needed to do. And, and the reason is that uh, current convolutional architectures are pooling layers, and in most cases, and pooling layers are effective for training the system. It, it, has a, you know, it provides inductive bias that you need to train these models, but then it, what, what happens is that you, know, you, you can't capture features, um, especially when there are large distortions in the input space. And, and, and to capture rotational features uh, is very important for, for spatial temporal modeling because you know, we know that turbulent flow has vortices that are moving around in space. So we wanted to be able to incorporate a differentiable model so that we can do end-to-end -end back propagation, but at the same time be able to make at least some portions of the network equivalent to rotations. So if this is a unit, our simple solution to having some sense of equivalence within this network, this is not a fully equivalent network, is to really have a spatial transformer in the latent space. So you ensure that your latent space undergoes a, a transformation, you know, undergoes you know, a, 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 an affine transformation, <coughs> affine transformation, and then you interpolate it based, on, your, based on, 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 on the input to the network, right? So this is called a spatial transformer network. And I, what I really did was I took a spatial transformer network and, and hooked it to the latent space of a unit. So I'm not making the entire network end-to-end -end equivariant. I'm just ensuring that this, this transformation is equivariant by construction so that when I go to the decoder, I have a representation which captures the richness of the rotational features of my field. So, uh, so we, so exactly the same way that we, that we did for the QG flow, uh, we started training this on observational data, the analysis data with an USTN network, this kind of a network. Again, ZT, ZT plus delta T. Here we have, uh, we have trained this model on 12 hourly Z500 data. And, 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 and this is what, uh, this is what, uh, this is what we get out of a, a free forecast of a free forecast. So we have about four or five, like maybe five days of accuracies for Z500 from error five reanalysis. analysis. And we realized that an equivariance preserving network in the, it's not equivariant end to end, it's only in the latent space, where an equivariance preserving network has, has better correlation as compared to say, uh, a regular unit. Not so much in the earlier days, maybe a little more as you move forward in time. And it can capture like subtle features like, like wave breaking. Like you see the wave breaking phenomenon happening in the high latitudes, which is being captured by the equivariance preserving network. And we don't necessarily say that we better represent these phenomena. These are very nonlinear phenomena, but maybe we better capture features that ultimately leads to a better representation of these phenomena. So that's the, this is what we realized, and this was just just a better network. Twelve years stands on the fact that we are uh, training this on twelve hourly data instead of hourly data, and there's a catch. The reason why I'm doing twelve hourly and not hourly, and I'll tell you about it. So this is what the ACC would look like. It has about you know, one and a half days. Uh, better accuracy. It's, it's a marginal improvement, 
but you know we we get uh, we'll, we'll take what we can get for these systems so it's about if you, if you cut things off at 0.6 it has about one and a half days of better accuracy to a regular uh very over, fa over parameterized network both of them these have undergone extensive hpo before we decided to use uh, this network now now adding data simulation to this is obviously a little more complicated because if you want to do forecasting on era five you need to be able to run an nwp model which is sort of not our forte but instead what you can think of is that you treat this ustn you treat this data driven surrogate as your dynamical model, as your background forecast model. So replace the dynamical model altogether. So you start with an initial condition on Z, you use your USTN, right, to predict Z T plus delta T, T plus two delta T, until for about 24 hours when you have an observation, and then you directly integrate this observation into your data-driven dynamical model, to say. And here, instead of using ensemble Kalman filter, we use an uncentered version of it, uh, because we were using the low resolution era five, we could actually afford an optimal number of ensemble members. The thing is, this system is about 2048 dimensional, right? This is the low resolution five and a half degree era five. And, and for the uncentered Kalman filter, the, uh, the optimal number of ensembles that you need is about two times the dimension of your system plus one. So we could really afford 4,000 ensembles because our forecasting model was a fully data driven model, which was trained previously. So uh, the, the formulation for US, uh, for, on, uh, for uncentered Kalman filter is very similar. You compute a Kalman gain uh, based on the Kalman gain, you get an analysis state at, at 24 delta T. And if you look at the results once again, this is the correlation, this is RMAC. Every time you have data assimilation, you see that your error goes down. Uh, I have, uh, these experiments have, uh, there's a two experiments here, one with a higher, higher degree of noise, one with a lower degree of noise. Obviously, the amount of noise you have in your observation governs the amount of accuracy of you have of your analysis state. But anything around, and, and this is in meters, this RMS is in meters for Z500, and this is correlation coefficient. So you see, you can get very decent correlation coefficient even with high degree of noise for this system. Now, uh, once we did that, we realized there's something more interesting here. And the interesting thing is that these data driven models don't, the, the error propagation in these data driven models don't quite behave the same way as the error propagation in numerical models. Uh, by saying that, what I mean is that if you train a model to predict 12 hourly data, 12 hourly states, you would likely to have a longer prediction horizon as compared to a model that is trained on hourly, hourly data or hourly state. So if your model is going from XT to XT plus one hour, you're going to lose prediction more quickly than a model that's going from XT to XT plus 10 hours. And this could be useful. Uh, uh, I don't want. I don't want to take up a lot of time talking about why this happens. Although we have some ideas, and now we have more uh, explainable experiments to show what happens. But we can leverage this thing. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is that USTN 12, which is trained on 12 hourly data, has a better prediction horizon as compared to USTN 1, which is trained on hourly data. Similarly for RMC. So a 12 hourly model is more accurate than an hourly model. So what we can do now is use both these models together in our data simulation scheme. And we call this uh, virtual observations. That is, if you, you, you really want to do prediction every hour, but you know your hourly model is bad and your 12 hourly model is much better. So let's use both these models in conjunction. So you have an hourly model doing prediction every hour until say, for example, 12 hours. What you do is you take the state predicted by the 12 hourly model and treat it as a virtual observation and integrate it to get an analysis state. So this is not a real observation. You don't have an observation from the system. What you have is a more accurate forecast. Let's treat it as a virtual observation and get a better estimate at this 12th hour so that you can start forecasting with a better initial condition at the 12th hour. And you keep doing that until you go to 24 hours, you get the real observation. So, when you do that, you see that the, the, the blue line is essentially the, the, this, the virtual observation framework, which we call the multi-step framework in this case. And what you see that every 12 hours, you have a peak in your, in your correlation or you have a drop in your RMC, which means that the virtual observations are really kicking in and helping you get an improved state as compared to the regular ML plus DA. And this happens throughout. And you have a divergent free filter at all times because you could afford 4,000 ensemble members. 
So this is really our approach to doing multi time step DA with, with multiple models. And it really works with data, data driven models, even for, for, for data as complex as observational weather data. So with this, I'll, I'll come to my conclusions and so, so that we can have some time for questions and about 10 minutes, about 30 minutes, as of 10 minutes beyond 12.30. So, <clears throat> so one of the challenges, always the challenge in these problems is building a skillful DDWP model, a data-driven weather prediction model that is, that is, uh, that is you know, competitive with operational models, right? But we're not far behind. There are, there are papers coming out more and more that are showing that we can really achieve this. And while most of them were on low-resolution uh, fields, uh, we, along with a few folks at Worky Lab and NVIDIA, have been working on this really monster of an AFNO model with 33 atmospheric variables at the native era five resolution, so the highest resolution era five. And, and these results are comparable to operational uh, operational IFS, which is ECMWF's operational model. So, uh, it, so it's really going somewhere. So really replace, so when like six years back, if people talked about replace a dynamical core with a data-driven model, no one would believe you. But six, like since then, there's been a lot of progress and maybe we can think about at least replacing some components. So for example, you can do all the atmospheric variables, maybe, but this is the first time we did about 33 atmospheric variables. And this preprint will be coming out very soon. Uh, there can be further improvement by having physics-based biases into the architecture. For example, equivariance was one of them. You could do other things like enforcing the loss function with some physical quantities. All of this is harder to do for real systems like real observational data, but, but, but one, can, one can think about doing this. Even if you have a great data-driven model, getting initial conditions in real time is a challenge. Like if you really, <clears throat> if you really want to um, uh, start forecasting uh, in real time, you'd, you'd want initial conditions coming in from a weather station at the same time as you want to forecast. This is, there is obviously an IoT sort of challenge there, which, which, which needs to be uh, taken care of. You have to look at further explorations in doing DA because data simulation is always a challenge. You need to be able to integrate your observations are noisy and sparse. You can never really use them. You have to be able to simulate them. So further improvements in data simulation with deep learning needs to be uh, performed. And finally, the holy grail in using data-driven models is that can we seamlessly integrate this data-driven weather prediction models uh, to get climatology? And at least today we can't do that because these models are, are unstable and, and they drift. Not that NWP models don't, even weather models will drift. They don't give you climate. That's why there's weather models are not climate models. But really one of the holy grace was that we could, could really do that, that we can integrate these data-driven weather prediction models because they don't have the same biases as, 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 as you know, numerical weather models. Maybe you would be able to integrate them. Currently, this is still things that we and other people are working on, but there's a lot of evidence that there is unphysical drifts and instability. So, this is more or less the challenges, less conclusions, more challenges. Uh, and with that, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great talk, Ashish. We do have a, you know, tons of, tons of questions from Pat, actually. I, I, actually, I, I don't even know where to start, Pat. Um, yeah, well, when that, you know, were... you know, so we don't have to go over these. I can always take them offline with, with the speaker. I, 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 I really learned a lot from this talk, okay? But Thank there are a bunch you. of assumptions you make along the way that uh, to someone like me who comes from a very different background, I'm going, well, why, why are you willing to assume that or this or this? And so I know that for the, the computational science audience uh, the, who, do, who do these kinds of models, many of these assumptions will be familiar. Uh, I think they are debatable and worth, worth exploring. But, uh, but I think the thing, biggest surprise for me, it wasn't that you were starting from from these fine-grained PDE models, right? That's a pretty common thing. Uh, what's really surprised me was the shift to, and I knew that ensembles are used in, in weather, weather prediction these days. Uh, I was, uh, but, but, but I've, I've, I've never understood the connection there because if you believe that Navier-Stokes equations or whatever are enough and they're correct, um, then why in the world do you need ensembles? And, and, and if you believe that the world is Markov, why do you need Kalman filtering? Th these, these are, there's, there's, a, there's a disconnect between, between, uh, the, between the, uh, the, the, the basic assumptions of, of 
PDE modeling and and the way that that people have gone ahead with with actually incorporating these ideas from statistics. It's not evil, but it's it seems to me violating core assumptions of what it means to build a scientific model. What's going on there? Can you help me understand the the motivation, or is it just a hack? Um, yeah, I can I can uh, give a give it a shot. Um, so why do we need ensembles if if Navier Stokes is accurate, right? Yeah. So one is even though so so we're not analytically solving Navier Stokes. We are approximating Navier Stokes with a numerical solver. So there are two sources of error here. Right. One is a model error. So so the Navier Stokes solver in this case the QG solver. Although it's as accurate a solver as I could write, it would have some finite sized approximation. So there's a model error here, which is very small because this is a it's a spectral solver. It's actually very small. You can neglect it for this for the time. But the other source of error here, which is a major sort of error, is the initial. Wait, 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 wait. wait, but won't those average out, or is there something about the chaotic nature of it that 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 does not let averaging get rid of of uh, the errors? Okay, so if you even if you neglect model error, the initial condition error will not average out because it's a chaotic system. It's a positive Lyapunov exponent. The initial condition error with which you are say you have a perfect, but an imperfect initial condition. So it will never actually be able to retrain the trajectory of your truth, and it will not average out because it's a it has a positive Lyapunov exponent and and the error would grow. Now what ensembling here does is that so so if you have an initial condition error. One way to go around it is ensembling. Now, what ensemble Kalman filter is doing is it's slightly different. What it's doing is that it is weighing in between this ensemble model forecast and again a piece of imperfect information that is coming from the observation. Now, this model forecast could have had a lot many errors. It could have had model errors. This model may not be, have been perfect. In this system, I've I've written a QG solver. In an NWP, uh, in a weather forecasting model, there is missing physics. So, so obviously, your model forecast is going to deviate a lot, even if you had a perfect initial condition, for example. But your observation is coming from the true system. It has all the physics, but it has other challenges. It's noisy. It's it's sparse. As soon as it's sparse, and you want to put it on inside a dynamical model, you need to interpolate onto the right grid. So there you have a process. So what what ensemble Kalman filter is doing is that in this equation, as you see, it's weighing in between the observation and the background forecast with this Kalman gain. And this Kalman gain is is sort of like you know if it was one dimensional, it would be like a weight. Whether sh should I should I trust my observations more? Should I trust my model forecast more? And right. and that trust is coming by looking at the the how the background covariance looks like if the background covariance looks good based on that you, you would decide on what the what the key is so that's, that's okay so so I, this is i mean as i expected this is a complicated answer to a complicated problem and that's all right um i don't even know how you would you know to a to a, may, maybe everyone else on the on the and listening in the talk already got this right but i certainly didn't and so i would urge, encourage you to to spend a couple of slides clarifying where this is coming from. In particular, yeah, where are the sources of error and how is how is the Kalman filter and the ensemble, how are they addressing those different sources of error? Um, and I and 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 so I I like I like the style of your answer. I'd like to understand more. Maybe Young Young Su can can introduce us by email and we can follow up separately. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'll and That's I'll be quiet and let other people talk. <laughs> I can certainly do that. Pat. Okay. Thank you so much for the question, Pat, um, and answering. Um, all right. Well, the robot said he had the same question and he's thanking you, Pat. Oh. Yeah. All right, um, so I, I don't know, if, if there's any other questions, please, um, please post it in the chat room or unmute yourself. Um, while you're doing that, let, let me ask my question. Oh, on, on this very slide, you're, Computing the covariance um, using the UNET. Um, yeah, yes. And that, and the UNET, you said, um, you know, it is accurate for like the first day. To up to say, for example, uh, up, 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 up to 24 hours or the one day or, um, and in order to achieve that accuracy, 
um, I, I was I was wondering if you can, you know, elaborate how you train the unit actually. Um, sure, sure. So this in this particular example, this this is a very regular unit. I don't have any physics constraints, equivariant stuff here. So the way it has been trained is that I've I've gen so I have a, I have simulation data a, lo a long long climate simulation from this QG flow. And this, the input to this unit is the stream function at both levels at time t. And the output is the stream function at both levels at time t plus 40 delta t. Here, 40 delta t is the advection time scale of this system. So I have trained this unit exactly in this fashion. I've shown it multiple samples of t and t plus 40 delta t. And I've learned a map between t to t plus 40 delta t. During inference, it's an autoregressive model. You put in an initial condition t, you get t plus 40 delta t. You take this prediction, plug it back into the unit, you get t plus 80 delta t. You plug it back, you get t plus 160 delta t, and so on. And and that's uh, um, in small scale data or the larger scale data, um, the data you use to train the unit? Uh, this is, uh, this. Uh, so uh, in this problem, uh, it's trained on the full high resolution, full resolution data. There's, there's no- There's a larger scale, the fine resolution. Yeah. Okay, and as you, as you increase the size of that da data, um, you will have a hard time training the unit itself. So we used about ten thousand data, for example, in this case. Uh, so you mean in terms of computational cost that that the yeah model? yeah yeah the... yeah this is an expensive training process to be honest. Uh, but I mean yeah. it's, this is this is a, this thirty six thousand dimensional to be so it's an expensive training process. But during inference, it can be you know as cheap as it gets. So yeah, it's trained on ten thousand days. Um, yeah, I don't doubt the inference will be very fast, and once it is trained very, um, you know, um, you know, accurately and uh, with enough data, um, yeah. the training is always the challenging part, right? Yeah. But the the training is pretty costly, yeah. Right, and uh, in for example, in global climate model, the the size of the data will be even even bigger. Yeah. Um, so, and it would have much more number of variables, but yeah, so it's. So like that, uh, the FNO model that we have been doing with NVIDIA, it has 33 atmospheric variables at quarter degree resolution. So it's a mammoth model. You have to do distributed, you know, model parallelism to, to really train it. But, but then, you know, once trained, you can actually deploy it in one, one GPU. So that's, that's, that's something. Yeah, yeah, once it is trained, yes. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, okay, we have a uh, question from Dave. At the end, uh, you showed how one could combine the one hour unit and a 12 hour unit yeah. and compare it to the one hour unit alone. How does the solution compare to using only the 12 hour unit? Okay. What, what is the advantage of the hourly calculation? Correct, correct. So uh, I'm not showing you the, uh, the, 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 the comparison with 12 hourly unit is because like, okay, so the assumption is um, you want predictions every hour. So it's it's not that if I used a 24 hour unit, I would have probably got gotten away with better accuracy. But the point is if you use that, then you don't get any prediction between zero and 24 hours. Or if you use just the 12 hour unit, you won't get predictions between zero and 12 hours. So you do one prediction every hour. So that's, that's the requirement. But how can you use hierarchically low fidelity models to improve that hour, you know, that forecast? Because until here, there is no improvement. But once you have the virtual observation, you have an updated state. So every hour from there would now have a better, <clears throat> better accuracy as compared to just using the hourly unit, right? So, so basically until here, there was hardly any change, but after that, you, you, you had an improvement in the state. So because these different fidelity models have different accuracies, I want to improve that. Ultimately, I need hourly forecasts. So I have to improve that. I can't just say I'll, I'll not use the hourly. I have to use the hourly model. But how can I reinforce the hourly model by using these virtual observations? So that that was the idea. That's why I didn't compare with the twelve hourly model. Sounds good. Thank you, Ashash. Um, David said thanks. I didn't catch the one hour forecast requirements. All right. Uh, any other question from audience? Um, Ashish, this is Romit. I have a quick question for you. I hey, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so it was regarding the the virtual observation concept. So, yeah. 
could you like just build it into the architecture with a resnet layer that does da like a da layer or something i don't know so yeah. that you have data simulation happening through a parallel sort of uh, operation at each time step perhaps uh, and you just choose the window of the output the total window of the output which could be like 12 in this case for example does that make sense no yeah make it okay. it it makes sense i mean we, we have to we have to like talk about it and and figure it, but but what you just said strikes right you're okay. you're right <clears throat> okay yeah another question is so you know like a lot of the papers that are being published recently these are all on the 64 by 32 resolution with the exam uh, with the exception of the work you're doing with nvidia so is there any value to those forecasts and I'm, i'm not talking about whether they work i'm just curious if anybody uses a 64 by 32 forecast not if you're looking at very large so we are looking at z500 data that's why okay 64 right. by 32 is okay but okay. the one that jaydeep is leading at nvidia that was at quarter degree so the other thing is uh, training on many variables so if you don't reduce the number of uh, don't reduce the resolution the native resolution mm -hmm. then training this model becomes very hard for large number of atmospheric variables that's why i mm -hmm. also looked at like things like just z500 t2m t850 very large scale slow moving variables right but right you want to look mm -hmm. at like, precipitation this is totally useless useless yeah mm -hmm. okay all right okay thank you so much go go Uh, going back to the 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 Ramit's first um, the comments about the parallel um, the implementation, it, it, I don't know. It it reminds me of the the parallel in time uh, algorithm. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure you, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. If, if you if you introduce the you know artificial uh, the observations and yes. th that is, that framework is totally possible to apply, right? Yeah. No. And take advantage of the time. That's that's right. As soon as Rumit mentioned it, I I realized that yeah, it it could it yeah, it's very possible. It's probably very possible. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So another question from Shady. The very nice talk, Ashesh. I might have missed that point, but when you introduce a rotational invariant neural network with a spatial transformer, it would see a low pressure zone on top of a high pressure zone. As the same as a high pressure zone on top of a low pressure zone, right? How is this physically consistent? Yeah. So uh, okay, let me clarify. So no, that uh, first of all, this was just a cartoon, uh, but but that's not what I was. Mean. What I meant was that um, if you have uh, to, so so uh, so con convolutional neural networks, especially with pooling. uh is is not rotationally equivalent which means that it cannot it cannot capture rotational distortion generally any large scale distortions in the input field so it can't ca capture rotational distortion in the input field not by construction it that doesn't mean that it can't that doesn't mean if you rotate a cat it won't be able to predict it if it's trained on you know all the images of cats so that's that's not why I mean but by construction it is not rotationally equivalent right trans it is translation variance it does it cannot capture rotational variances in the input field So this was one, and not just rotation, any relative orientations. So I think uh, you can actually find a very good uh, uh, overview of exactly how that works. In so so in this painting, for example, uh, this this would be, for example, classified by a coordinate to be a, a face, where in reality it's not really a face because the relative positions of 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 the eyes and the and and the lips that sort of change. So changes in relative positions can be captured by construction. Once again, I use the word construction because. if you train on enough data data augmentation these things can do anything so when when we are doing this work on extreme events we realize this is one of the problems we were having that these two large if these two were captured as large features in 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 one of the layers in in a convnet they were they, they both of them were captured as the same feature basically both of them were leading to the same prediction but they they might not they may they should not right because this might cause something this will definitely not cause something so and we realized that the issue was with the fact that it was not rotationally equivalent and at that time we solved it by doing capsules because but then we realized capsules has you know other implementation challenges especially with scaling and stuff so we went ahead with spatial transformers again spatial spatial transformers would do is that it would ensure that i am capturing the rotation or any any so to like yeah rotation scaling and uh, you know translation so anything in the in, in the r theta matrix it would capture 
uh, from input to from input to output. Here, of course, we can't afford a, a, an end-to-end -end spatial transformer, so we just put it on the latent spatial transformer. That, does that right. make sense? I I hope that answers the Shady's question. Um, but is it sufficient, Shady? I assume it is. All right. Uh, is there any questions? Okay, he said it makes sense. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Is there any questions uh, from audience? Oh yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, yeah, I'm actually working on totally different kind of domain, like subsurface problem, but dealing with very similar kind of uh, framework. Uh, we are using some data simulation as well, and then when you do uh, some construction of this data-driven model, and is there any way to incorporate certain kind of physical constraint rather than just data-driven only, so that you may be able to kind of uh, preserve certain properties like some invariance. I think your transformer uh, kind of uh, algorithm may, may good, but I think when I look at some other kind of turbulence kind of community or fluid dynamics, they really try to preserve certain properties either from tensor or some other physics, right? And and since I, I'm quite curious about this kind of uh, weather forecasting as well, so you may have certain quantity you really want to preserve during data driven consumption. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been a there's been actually a lot of work around that. Now uh so if you were doing a more canonical fluid dynamic assistance, you could think about putting conservation laws, right? Now yeah. you can do it in two ways. You can do it in the loss function. So you have a penalty term with a conservation law, which is a soft constraint, which means that it will not be exactly satisfied. Or we could come up with a clever way to change a, to write a custom layer that incorporates the conservation law. Right? If you're doing, for example, divergent free condition, then you could you know, predict on the curl of your output so that it would, and then have a custom layer with, with your divergence so that it becomes by default divergence free and things like that. But obviously for weather and climate, it's, it's much more difficult to think about these things. But uh, I would, uh, well, but there have been work around it. So, for example, for generalizing neural networks across climate change scenarios, there has been some work done by Tom Weichler in terms of um, um, scale, like using the classes Klepper on relationship to scale the input so that it generalizes. That's one thing. And then again, the same guy, Tom, uh, probably Tom Weichler has, and definitely Mike Preachers, would they have a paper in PRL where they talk about putting any kind of hard constraint into neural architectures. And then they show an example with, with uh, either a convection or some thermodynamic quantity in a, an actual atmospheric model. But that paper is about putting hard constraints in architecture, analytical hard constraints in architecture, and any general hard constraints. Uh, it's a paper in PRL that came out maybe a year ago that really talks about how to do. But yeah, it is definitely possible, and there have been different, different work around it. But it's obviously much more difficult for weather and climate as compared to canonical like fluid dynamical systems, and it's much more, say, tractable. Yep. I mean, if time allowed, I have one more following go question. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you touch based on very important aspect of this weather forecasting because your weather forecasting really influenced by your initial condition dramatically. Weather changes quite a bit, and like for data-driven forecasting, how robust actually your uh, data-driven forecasting model really uh, account for those change of initial condition? Otherwise, you have to retrain your model with different initial condition every time. Right? Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, that's a great, great question. So, uh, you're obviously talking about a change in initial condition that is coming in due to a distributional shift in your system, right? For example, climate change has happened, so you're in, so that that kind of change in initial condition that you're talking about, right? Where you have to retrain your model entirely. So, yes. Um, under a situation where there's distributional shift, that means that for this climate change, system has changed, Reynolds number has changed, something has changed. These models will not generalize. That's the, that's the like that's that's the final answer. There is no way these generalizes. So uh, we have worked on this extensively. One of the things we can do is transfer learning. Of course, transfer learning is again uh, a whole new different ball game. Which layers do you retrain? How much data that you do you need? Um, so we have a very nice explainability framework around it. The way to go about generalizing these neural networks is to do transfer learning. 
unless you come up with a very clever relationship so that if you're like, for example, Tom Boyklos paper, it looked at variables which you know were affected by temperature and you use the classic Klepron relationship to scale in a way, a very clever paper, but it was, and, 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 and it really looked at generalization. But if you don't have the, uh, you don't have the luxury, if you don't have that kind of relationship for certain systems, then the only way to go about it is doing transfer learning. And then you have to understand which layers to retrain how are how what are the physics that is getting transferred how we can really optimize which layers you can retrain so we have this framework where you can look at the change in your system and then determine which layers to retrain by looking at loss surfaces and things like that and this was heavily motivated by stuff that michael mahoney does uh, i know he gave a talk a couple of maybe weeks back so yeah the way to go about is transfer learning and there may be ways to improve how to effectively do transfer learning, maybe even online mode, if you don't have uh, capabilities the way Tom Boyklet did in that paper. Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks for yeah detailed yeah explanation. I mean, that's kind of you know, what we are kind of thinking about. But you know, I think by uh, based on my experience, actually, some kind of challenge uh, we face through the actual data or uh, kind of problem itself really give us some chance to think about more kind of a smart way. Yep, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your response. Thank you. Thank you so much for the good question and um, the, the nice answer uh, by Asus. Um, is there any other questions? Um, okay, if not, let's thank our speaker, Ashish. I'm, I'm, I, um, Thank you so much for the great talk and um, a wonderful Q&A session. Um, um, Ashish, you are hiding yourself. <laughs> uh, let, let me, I'll stop sharing. Oh, All right. oh, okay, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, thank you so much for, um, uh, for hosting me. Thanks a lot. I hope to keep okay. in touch, yeah. Yeah, that would be wonderful. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will. Uh, I think we have a, another DDPS seminar next week, so I will announce that uh, as as soon as I get uh, all the the information from the speakers. All right. Until then, uh, have a nice weekend and week, everyone, and I will see you next week. All right. Let me. Start, uh, thank you.